Come on and shine, shine, shine. Las Vegas, shine your light on me. Welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. Join award-winning host Dale Davidson as he interviews the most remarkable people you'll find in the entertainment capital of the world. You'll meet entertainers, sports figures, newsmakers, community and business leaders, and people just like you with stories that'll touch your heart. Now, here's Dale Davidson. And welcome to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. Each and every episode, we bring you fascinating guests. We've outdone ourselves this time, way outdone it. <laughs> How's that? Can you live up to it? That's pretty good. No, now I'm intimidated. <laughs> Sam Sorbo. Sam, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. It's fun yeah, to be here yeah, with you. It's wonderful to have you. We're at the Freedom Fest. Tell me what brings you to the Freedom Fest at the Paris Hotel in Las so Vegas. So the, the main reason that I'm here is because our film, our new film with my husband, we produced a film called Miracle in East Texas. Right. And so we're showing it at the Anthem Film Festival, which is an offshoot of the Freedom Fest. It is. And so that shows tonight. But I'm also presenting twice uh, based on my, my real passion, which it, it, I shouldn't say real passion, but my primary passion yeah. is home education. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, let's yeah. talk about that right away. All right. Your kids all homeschooled? Yes. And you have three? I have three. Tell me about your kids. So my oldest was in second grade and I just in, in the public school, which was a very good school. Yeah, I'm sure. And um, we, we actually moved to that community because the school was right. so good. I do this because people don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Good compared to what? Yes. Okay? We are, I think we're 27th in the world. We're the United States of America, and we rank like 27th in our school standings, in wow. our education Literacy standings. Literacy and everything else. Everything combined, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Um, I can't remember what the individual statistics are, but there's one for reading, one mm -hmm. for math. Anyway, it averages out to 27th in the world. That's not Which that puts great. us behind Lithuania. Right. Nothing against Lithuania, <laughs> but we're the United yeah, States. We spend yeah. so much per student. I think yeah. we're second in the world next to Switzerland with the amount of money that we spend per student. So that's not the solution. No, clearly not. And smaller not. class size is not the solution. You know, there are, there are a lot of problems with the entire system of education. Yeah. One of which is that our schools form a wedge between the child and the parent. This is what that's parents fail yeah. to recognize. So while we're focusing on education, which by the way, they're not accomplishing, Right. Because education is the ability to hear someone else's opinion and not lose your self-confidence. Yeah, sure, sure. And yet, what do we see everywhere? Yeah. We need safe spaces. You've triggered me. I right. need trigger warnings. Uh, all of that, right? I'm a snowflake. I'm a snowflake. Yeah. I'm not a snowflake. Yeah, I know. That's right. what they're saying. Yeah. So, so, so in second grade, uh, the school wasn't getting it done for my son. Yeah. There were a couple of different things. I won't, go, I won't bore you with that. They're in my book. A um, couple different stories of how I just came to the realization that, gee, maybe I could fail not as badly as the school was failing. <laughs> Seriously, because the bar is really low. They set yeah. the bar really low. Yeah. So yeah. I brought the kids home. And I said to my husband, who was skeptical, obviously, right. his father's a school teacher. He grew yeah, up, you know, right. and, and we grew up with sort of the American dream of you, you go up. Well, he did. I shouldn't say I did because I hated school and school really didn't like me. Really? Really? <laughs> I, I had, I think I was, I think I was absent from school like more than anybody ever. Just and, didn't like going. No, I really, I really disliked it. Yeah, I yeah. disliked the social atmosphere. I disliked the, the way things were taught. They, they, made, they made learning boring. When I got to college and I had to take a history course mm -hmm. and I hated history, mm -hmm. I took the hardest course so that it would challenge me so that I wouldn't get bored and flunk. Mm -hmm. And the hardest course was a seminar course on American history that was absolutely brilliant. It made history come alive. And I fell in love with history. See, that's the what you thing, needed, yeah. The other thing our education system does is it bifurcates your either humanities, which means that you like reading and you like yeah. writing or and you're good STEM. at this, or your STEM, yeah. which is mm -hmm. absolutely preposterous. And yes. it's an awful thing that we do. All of our all of our curriculum, the way that I homeschool, all of our curriculum is integrated. 
because science is not without history. Sure, yeah. There is a history of science. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand history, you can't understand how science evolved or became the science that we have today. Yeah, yeah. But if you separate things, then, uh, then you're more likely to believe in global warming. <laughs> yeah, <I see laughs> just it. put it that way. Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> no. right, I understand. So, yeah. so, so I brought the kids home in second grade and I said, I'll do it for one semester. Just to see. Just to see. Yeah. And I, and I did it for the semester and I went, this is like, this is like the bee's knees. This is like, right. th this is the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. And we are robbing parents of the gift of their children. I say to parents, your children are a gift to you. Why would you send them to someone else to open? Yeah, that's nice. I like that. And yeah. it's, a, it's a travesty. Yeah. So, so I do say that the, that the school, and I don't blame teachers. They are part of the system. They're, they're, they're sort of suckered into being part of this system. Yeah. But it's a broken system. And the funny thing is, nobody contests that it's a broken system. Everybody agrees, oh, the system's broken. Well, do something about it. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm here to do. For those people, and we'll talk about your book here in a second, but for those people who are considering homeschooling and a little intimidated by the idea, tell me how you got started. Here we go. They're your kids, an inspirational journey from self-doubter to homeschool advocate. So I go. doubted myself. Yeah, you were uh, I sure. didn't can think I, that I could get it I done. Can I do this? Yeah. But what, what convinced me was the school wasn't getting it done. And I went, well, if they can't do it, yeah. I cannot do it as, as good as they can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> right? It's a little yeah, convoluted. Yeah. yeah, I know what you're but saying. But to convince yeah. myself, yeah. I, had to, I sort of had to go there. And then about an hour, uh, an hour a year and a half in, I really started doubting myself again. Really? And so I enrolled the boys in a tiny private Christian school setting right. that was part hybrid. It was, it was a hybrid thing, so I would homeschool them two days a week and then they'd go to school for three days a week. And I thought this was gonna be the, the be all and end all. Oh yeah. And it turned out that in fact, when they go to school, they get back on the treadmill. Really? It is a treadmill, it's an assembly line. That's what our schools are, they're the mm. assembly line technique. So get a kid, put him on the treadmill and then, or on the conveyor belt, I should say, and then just stuff him full of information. Right. And then when he comes out, is he educated? No, he just has a bunch of information. Yeah. But he's never really taught what to do with that information. Just spew we, it back on a test. Yes, we teach kids yeah. what to think, not mm -hmm. how to think. Yeah. And so I, but, but I hadn't been convinced of that yet. So I thought, okay, this little private school is gonna get it done. And um, wow. after six weeks, I went in had a meeting with the teacher because I wanted to make sure that I was holding up my end of the deal, right? right yeah. And she hit me with about 10 minutes of how well behaved my child was. What's because our teachers these days yeah. are behavior therapists, like they're behavior specialists. They kind of have to be. They kind of have to be. Yeah. You got 30 yeah. kids in a classroom, 25 yeah. kids in a, your main concern right. is that they don't get out of hand. Yeah. yeah. And so she regaled me with stories of how um, how she put the misbehaved child next to my son because my son was so polite and so well behaved. And all the time, a little voice in my head going, not his, not his job, not, that's not what he's here for. Yeah, in fact, yeah. my response to that, I didn't say this out loud, but I thought, that's not what I wanna hear. What I wanna hear is he's disruptive. Yeah. I want to hear yeah. my son is so enthusiastic with learning. He's raising his hand all the time, <laughs> interrupting. But why is this? But how is that? Yeah. And, and, and not, I didn't. Yeah. And I sat there going, wow, we are at cross purposes. Yes. Yeah. And that's what that's fundamental the, difference between two approaches. That's right. Yeah. And that's the difference yeah. for uh, our, our education system and most parents. I would say most parents. What do, what do most parents want for their children? Right. Our education system, what does it want? It wants college prep and career readiness. Yes. Is a parent's greatest desire for their child and what they want to spend that much time on a good job? It's not the be all and end all. That's not what we want. Yeah. At least that's not, not what well, I want for yeah, my kids. Yeah, we want well-educated people who know how to think. Who know how to think. Yeah. It can who make know how to be discern, good. Yeah good, mm -hmm. who know the difference between good and evil, mm -hmm. who know how to honor God, mm -hmm. who know how to, how, to, how to be a member of a community, mm -hmm. right? And yet in school, what do we teach? Ageism, by default. Yes. What do we teach? Yeah. You know, here's another really compelling reason to consider homeschool. You have to understand that when you drop your child off at school, you are tacitly telling them that you are not capable of teaching them. Of teaching them. 
You're tacitly telling them that. Don't tell right. me that, okay, maybe five-year-olds don't know this, but other kids know, oh, homeschooling's an option. Like, homeschooling's there. Right. It doesn't matter anyway. You tell them by dropping them off that the teacher has the authority. They come home, daddy, daddy, you have to sign this. The teacher says you have to sign this. Okay, give it to me, I'll sign it. Whoop, you just went under the authority of the teacher. Right. Now what the teacher says uh, supersedes your authority. Yes. And yes. we wonder why teens come back and go, you can't tell me that, you don't know that. Why our teenagers yeah. are like pushing back. Yes. I don't deal with pushback from my kids. Really? It's not that we don't butt heads sometimes, yeah. but we discuss it. And, I, and, and, and my word goes, dad's word goes. Yeah. Because we are the authorities in the house. They understand that. And they understand that. Yeah. And no one has questioned our authority yeah. to our children. What about the parents who say, my kids won't be socialized. They will be great kids at home. They will be sure. wonderful children. They will be well behaved. They will be educated. But they won't be able to get along with other kids. Well, just be clear, if your main goal in sending your child to school is not education, but right. socialization, maybe that's one way to get socialized. It's no guarantee. Yeah. Your kid could just as easily be the bullied kid in school, and that would be a horrible experience for sure. them. Yeah, sure. But sure, give it a whirl, why not? If we're playing roulette, <laughs> look, we're in Vegas, we might as well gamble <laughs> with our children. <laughs> <laughs> We're gambling with I'm everything sorry. else in our lives. I have so I have so in the back of my book, I have a, I have a list of the of the ten top top objections. Oh, I can't okay. do it because because yeah. And socialization is one. Of, well, what about yeah. socialization? Uh, that should yeah. not be your primary concern. Right. Figure it out. Get yeah. your kids involved in karate. Do the soccer thing. Right. Do do other there are other ways to socialize your children. And when they're young, yeah. they don't socialize. They don't. Right. You put your child in preschool, that child plays next to other child who plays yeah. by themselves. Yeah, yeah. right? I've seen and it. And sometimes yeah. they fight over toys. Yeah. And by the way, so, so this, is, this is kind of interesting. Why do you tell your child that they should share? That's like completely anti, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, we do and we yeah. want them to learn to share, yeah. but yeah. it's completely antithetical to sort of, yeah. you know, but I want it and I want Counter it. Counterintuitive. It's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, it really It's is. kind of socialist. Yeah, so if you want to raise good little socialists, <laughs> that might be one way to do it. There you go, there you Actually, go. Actually, it is one way to do it. Yeah. Why do you think Bernie Sanders had so much support in the last election? Oh yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Let's talk about politics for just a minute. And then Why we'll, not? I've already blown it with everybody. <laughs> no, that's, you have not. They, they love you already. Oh, funny. Um, there's a huge divide in our nation. No. Right? There is. It's true. Um, part of it is generational, I think. And this upcoming generation is different than my generation, your generation. Do you think that the generational divide is worse than it used to be? I do. That's because of schooling. <laughs> yeah, it could very well be. You're making yeah. my point for me. Yeah. It's yeah. because we're teaching yeah. children that their parents' authority doesn't matter. Yeah. The school's authority supersedes the parents' authority, yeah. and the school's telling them socialism is the way to go. You have to care about the planet. Global warming is true. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think about like all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oil is bad, coal is bad. What else are they telling yeah. them? Uh, socialism works. Hello? Yeah. Can I get a Anywhere. history class? Anywhere. <laughs> You don't have to go back Che that Guevara far. was go a good Venezuela. guy. Oh, go online and yeah. look up Che Guevara on Wikipedia. Yeah. He was a good guy and slightly misunderstood. And, he, and by the way, just yeah. so you know, he did not like illegal immigrants. He hated <laughs> them and he wanted them all deported. Yeah. And he was a murderer. Don't forget that. Part. Well, of course. He was yeah. an enormous murderer. And nobody, by the way, he yeah. hated gays, okay? <laughs> so you snowflakes out there with your special, I mean, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. They know yeah. so little. Yeah, I know. It's just amazing. And that's the product of our education. So you talk about, you talk about the divide generationally. Yeah. Absolutely, I would say the biggest cause of that is our education system. Yeah. And the education system, which, by the way, has been taken over by Common Core, and don't we want our children to be common? <laughs> Isn't that what we want these days? That's why they call it Common Core. If you don't want your child to be common, I don't know why you're sending them to school. Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah. the generational divide, granted. Yeah. I think that the political divide that you're talking about 
that if we can get away from the gender, if we can just just talk about liberals, say, conservatives, yeah. believers. I think that it is it has absolutely been enhanced by the Democrat Party to an end. So it's sort of like, do you remember that thing you did when you were a kid and you swung your arms about and you walked towards somebody and you're like, I'm just swinging my arms here and if you get in the way, it's your fault. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, this is, I believe this is what the Democrats do. Yeah, yeah. So they say divisive things. They call Trump a racist. There's absolutely no evidence of his racism. Ever. They just don't like what he says, yeah, okay? Right. But they say he's a racist and therefore he's causing a divide. No, you are with your accusations. Right. Do you know he just called out four congresswomen, right? right? Mm -hmm. Didn't name them. And then they called a press conference. <laughs> and then four congresswomen out of the blue said he's talking about us. What yeah. did he say about them? Yeah. What did he say? He said they hate America. Yes. Well. So they're copping to hating America yeah. themselves. They volunteer. They say he's talking about us because we hate America, <laughs> but we don't hate America. What? Yeah. Make a decision. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was really amusing that he didn't name them. Right. And then they called a press conference and all four of them stood there. Yes. By the like... way, he, he said they should go <laughs> back to their home countries. Well, how many of them have home countries yeah. that are not America? Just. Yeah. Just one of the women who spoke up. So the other yeah. women clearly were not, were, he, he didn't intend them. He must yeah. have intended some other women. Yeah, that's <laughs> I like the way he stirs things up, don't you? <laughs> he really does. Oh, Trump? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, gosh, he's yeah. the greatest gift to, yeah. the, to the United States of America in a yeah. long time. He's a, he's a magician, you know, it's like, watch this hand, because down yes. here. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of that. I think oh, he yeah. plays them. Oh, he, he and, absolutely does. And I think it. it's going to get better and better before the election. I can see why you're a radio talk show host. <laughs> we want to talk about that when we come back. Okay. We will be back with the fascinating, intelligent, and beautiful <laughs> Sam Sorbo you forgot right after dishes. this. <laughs> <laughs>A potential audience of more than 50 million people is reached every week by Las Vegas tonight. To keep the important message of Christ's love on the air, we need your prayers and financial blessings. Please send your tax-deductible gift to Dale Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. For a donation of $25 or more, We'll send you a copy of Dale Davidson's new book, Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints. You'll love these inspiring stories of Las Vegas Christians who are changing the world. Or donate to the ministry, or order Dale's book by going to vegasaints.org. That's vegasaints.org. Or call us today at 702-480-3989. That's 480-3989. God bless you. The Lord has made it possible for our show, Las Vegas Tonight, to thrive. We've produced well over 300 episodes telling the remarkable stories of Christians who have set out to change the world for the better. It's my honor to lead this ministry. As the founder of Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries, I'm commanded to be a good steward of all the donations our partners have so generously provided to us. As you can imagine, it takes a great deal of money to keep this program on the air in the United States and around the world. Please prayerfully consider making a one-time donation or becoming a monthly partner of Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries. Just go to vegasaints.org and select Make a Donation or send your check or money order made out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. For more information, call 702-480-3989. Thank you and God bless you. Drawn by the lights, glamor, and opportunities in Sin City, they come from all over the world, searching for their chance to be a pretty woman, a success, or maybe just to have a better life. Be somebody. What happened after they got here is literally changing the world. From the story of Tommy Scott, a former gang enforcer turned Christian evangelist, to the Hookers for Jesus Outreach Ministry, 
to the heart-wrenching story of Arturo Martinez and his heroic act of forgiving the man who assaulted and murdered his wife and 10-year-old daughter. Las Vegas Tonight presents an extraordinary depiction of Las Vegas as a city of transformation from Sin City to Vegas Saints. Las Vegas Tonight, from Sin City to Vegas Saints, a collection of true stories of transformation, people whose lives were transformed, and people who are now transforming the world. Welcome back to Las Vegas Tonight. I'm your host, Dale Davidson. We have a fascinating guest. <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> Mrs. Sam Sorbo. We yes. went through an entire segment without mentioning your husband. Except you said my husband once. I did. Yeah. He's like a famous guy. Do you want to tell anybody who Kevin he is? Kevin Sorbo, ladies and gentlemen. Actor, director, writer. Yes. Producer, just like you. You're yes. all of those things. Yes. Yeah. Only you were on Hercules, but you weren't Hercules. I, I was Hercules. Herculette? <laughs> Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. I played a princess on Hercules. Yeah. And life imitates art. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. And then here you are. Yeah. His princess. So on our first date, he said to me, I know where I'm going to get married. Because that's what every little boy dreams of, right? Yeah. It was kind of like, <laughs> Never. wow, this is an interesting first date. Yeah. And he said, there's a little chapel in the Swiss Alps. And I said, in Garmisch? And he said, yes, how did you know that? And I said, oh, I have a picture of it hanging on my wall that my grandfather gave me. Where I want to get married. And he said, he said, and I'm going to have three children, boy, boy, girl. And I said, that's so weird. That's what I'm having, boy, boy, girl. <laughs> and that's what we had. Wow. That's remarkable. Yeah. Tell me about your faith. How'd you come to Christ? So um, I went on a search. I was raised as a, I was raised in an atheist household. Really? As a Jew, mm -hmm. we celebrated Christmas and Easter. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit confusing, yeah. to put it mildly. Uh, I went to Sunday school. Um, they were culturally Jewish. No. Not even that. No, because we celebrated Christmas and Easter. I know, so it's they, weird. Yeah. So it was interesting times anyway uh, yeah. um, that didn't really work I kind of walked away from that because there was no support at home yeah if you think that your children are gonna get their religion at church or at synagogue you're wrong they won't I'll just say that flat yeah. out that's yeah. not where children learn their religion it's where they might learn some specifics maybe although the Sunday schools that we have going these days uh, you know it, I, I talked to a Sunday school teacher who had been teaching Sunday school for 30 years. Not a single parent had ever asked her what she taught. Really? Yes. So you need to have these That's conversations with your children. In fact, my second book, which of course I forgot, um, is um, a devotional called Teach From Love. And it goes through godly characteristics. And it's good even for teachers in secular schools because there are secularist, there are, you know, stories in there that are not biblical, even though Bible stories are perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. You just can't say God this and God that. But right. the stories of the Bible are all, all pertinent to today. It's great literature. It is great literature. It's yeah. great history. Yeah. Um, and the idea is not that we need everybody to believe in God, but we need everybody to believe in virtue. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand the yeah. definition of virtue. Yeah. And so, so I wrote this devotional. Um, it's, a, it's called a school year devotional. It's for parents to sit down with their kids and discuss godly characteristics and why they're important. Why do we tell the truth? Why do we tell the truth? Yeah. And since we're on that topic, why do we swear to tell the truth on the a Bible? The whole truth on the Bible, yeah. yeah. Some people don't. Yeah. I think John Brennan swore, it, swore to uphold his oath of office on an unsigned copy of the Declaration of Independence, if I remember correctly. That's odd. It's like signing it on toilet paper. I don't know why you yeah. would. Why would you do that? Swearing it on, you know, yeah. a tissue. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and we've had a couple Muslim congressmen who have. They swear the it on the Quran. On the Quran. So where in the Quran does it say you may not lie? Yeah. Because our Bible says you don't lie. That's right. That's one of the <laughs> top ten. Saying. That's one of the top ten. I'm just saying, yeah. yeah. And the so, Quran says it's okay. So, um, so I went on a search in my 20s and discovered order in the universe. Yeah. There are a lot of different ways to get to God. There's a, there are a lot of paths of apologetics. I followed sort of my own. I did some research. 
And then I started attending church. And um, the funny story there is I asked my girlfriend at one point, hey, do you go to church? And she goes, yeah. You know, people <laughs> get weird when you ask yeah. them if they go to church. Um, and I said, would you, would you mind if I tagged along one day? And she goes, no, I suppose that'd be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, she had only just recently started, restarted going to church. She found oh. a church that she liked, and, and so she started going again. Mm -hmm. And the reason that she had stopped going to church is she felt like the church demanded that she proselytize, and she was uncomfortable oh, I with see. that. Yeah. So when I reached out and said, would you be able to bring me to church? She kind of did this. Well, if that's what you meant, <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> That's not that hard. Isn't it funny? Yeah, that's and, right. And yet, you know, <laughs> you know, Penn Jillette, who's speaking at the Freedom Fest. I know. Said something really very clever. He said, if you believe that a train is heading in my direction. Right. And I'm standing on the tracks. And you firmly believe that. If you don't at some point haul off and tackle me, I have no respect for you and your faith. So if, you, if, if we believe as Christians yes. in the Bible, in God, in Jesus, right? The idea that we don't share that with people. Mm -hmm. I, buy, I buy a great pair of pants. Somebody says, hey, I like your pants. I say, this is where I got them. This is how much they cost. This is probably still there. Or if this they're not, they're this on is sale. right. All that, right. yeah. So we used to, um, we travel a lot with our kids. And uh, every single plane ride, every single one, one of the stewards would come up and say, are those your children? Because sometimes we sit separate apart. Yeah, it's, sure. We're five, we can't all sit together. Right. Are those your children? They're so well behaved, they're so polite. Yes. And we'd always say thank you, they're homeschooled. But I'm, I'm stopping doing that, now I say thank you, they're Christian. Oh, that's, that's nice, I like that. By the way, that story you just told about Penn mm -hmm. he said that to my friend, Tim Barron's. Oh, okay, yeah, Tim Barron's, sure. Yeah, you know Tim. I don't yeah. know him, but yeah. um, but, he's but been, I saw the movie, I got the t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, he's been, <laughs> he's been working on Penn Jillette for 10 years. Yeah. And he sees him, often goes up to him, he's just as tall as he is. Oh, that and makes it easier. Yeah, he's like two <laughs> six eight guys. Because I'm like I this. I remember you. <laughs> yeah, they're giants. <laughs> and uh, he said it to him. Yeah. And it's really an interesting thing, and that's the one thing I respect about Penn Jillette. Oh, that's it. he's an honest broker. <laughs> yeah, he is. You know, yeah. um, he used to be less, less that. Yeah. So yeah. to me, he's come a long way. Yeah. And, and to be a libertarian and to be vocal about what he believes in, um, yeah. I, I hand it to him. It is difficult to have conservative values. And be in show business. In, well, certainly to be in show yeah. business, but even just in today's culture, it's yeah. difficult. I know too many conservatives who won't talk about, at, at any workplace, they won't talk about it. Yeah. There was a woman up in Portland, she's a writer, a reporter, um, and she, she started hashtag me neither. And she <laughs> wanted to have a conversation yeah. questioning some of the accusations oh, that, yeah. that are just... People just make accusations and they don't require any kind of evidence because right. we are no longer evidence-based. Yes. We've become all feelings-based. Yes. Why? This is a quiz. Why? Education. Education. <laughs> Thank you. No, but, but I got the there. Thing. It took me a while. But, but the thing is, it's true. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking truth. Yes. We, in fact, there was a big push in the past, I'm going to say 15 years, to shift to emotional education. So there's a lot of the education now that is emotionally based. Well, that makes sense because it's all relativistic. And how do I feel about this? Well, common core math. Yeah. Uh, if you say five and five is 11, as long as you can show how you got there. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, right? Yeah. Speaking of which, do you consider yourself a libertarian? No. No? No. Conservative. Yeah. Because of their social standing. I mean, their social um, issues. It's just I'm, I'm more conservative than anything. Yeah. And um, yeah. I, so once, I've, once I found conservative, I'm like, oh, check that box. And then I didn't then really look any further. Yeah. Um, I know some of the positions of libertarianism. Yeah. Um, I still believe 
that we need we need a central government, but it needs right. to be small. Yeah. And the liberta and by the way, the Libertarian Party is a, a fairly vast spectrum. Yes, it so is. So if I don't identify with the guy out here, I probably quite identify with the guy over yeah, here. Right. Um, and so you just have to, you know. Well, that's the way parties used to be. You know, Ronald Reagan said the big tent. Mm -hmm. If you say you're a Republican, come on in. Right. We'll cure you. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and we well, want to participate. We'll help but you now out. And if you're willing you're to this, consider, yeah. right? And we want yeah. you to consider, you consider the different issues and you consider your position and yeah. their position and the different sides. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's not the case with the Democrats anymore. No, it's not. Because they've gone full tilt leftist. Oh, it's socialism now. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. You know, agree with this or you're a bigot, by the way. Right. Yeah. Right. Or you're, uh, what's the word? Uh, deplorable. Oh, and basket of deplorables and irredeemable wow. and that was the most important thing wow everybody fixated on deplorable yeah but the next thing that she said hillary yeah. was your irredeemable what does that mean wow if you can't That's redeem it well it is yeah and if you can't redeem it what value does it have yeah zero yeah, and that's sure. where they come off that's where the communisms the communists came off and they buried well they didn't bury a hundred million people in the last hundred years yeah. because those people were deemed to be irredeemable worth nothing worth nothing yeah. what does christianity say yeah. everybody, everybody is redeemable yeah. everybody has value that's right so you know you make your choice everybody has value or maybe you have no value wow. and that's where that leaves us with this nihilistic why, why do you think we have a, a rise in teenage suicide they're products of our education system, which teaches right. them what? That they are accidents of nature, that Darwin is fact, Darwinism is fact, right. which it isn't, yet to be proved, it's remember? It's a theory, it's only a missing a theory. link, we still yeah. don't have that. Right. Darwin himself argued against it in the book. Wow. If you read the book, wow. he said without finding that missing link, none of this is basically worth anything. Yeah, um, but just in case, But we're teaching. Well, just in case, he published his book in advance of someone else that he found out someone else was going to publish it. Wow, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So he yeah. wanted to get the scoop on yeah. them. Yeah. And so he, pu he knew that it was incomplete. Sure. It is incomplete. Sure. Um, but it's easy for nihilists, progressives, socialists, Marxists, leftists, <laughs> whatever, the reds, yeah. uh, <laughs> to, to, you know, say, oh, okay, this, yeah. this, is the, this is the truth. How dare they teach children in school that they are accidents of nature? Yeah, I know. It's horrible. It's child abuse. Yeah. And speaking of attitudes and irredeemability, uh, we're teaching our kids by being pro-abortion that there is no value to human life. That's right. Period. That's so right. why not hang yourself? This is a disaster. Isn't that kind of what's going on? It's a disaster. Yeah. The, the other, there's another component of this, and that is that because we have become so affluent as a society, right. our children aren't needing to work. True. Right? It used to be you had eight kids because yeah. you needed people on the farm. On the farm, you needed them right. Milking the cows early right. in the morning yeah. and gathering the eggs and stuff. And we don't have that anymore. And so I really encourage parents to give their children chores that are necessary. Yes. Um, there's too many stories of older children who say that they considered suicide, but they couldn't do it because they knew that their younger siblings needed them. We need to make our children feel included in a in a family relationship. Yeah. Why is the school? Why do I have a trouble with the education system? It's because it pulls children out of the family. It pits them against each other through ageism because we have ageism in our classrooms. Sure, we do. And um, and then it spits them back out, and so you have a less cohesive family unit. And the children have been taught that they're accidents. Yeah. And they've been taught that they're better than or worse than their siblings. Right, right. And um, so it's 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 a it's a it's an untenable equation. And now we when we first started with public school, which was not at the beginning of this nation, by the way, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like this was going to be a great thing. And we were teaching biblical values. Oh, and yeah, we were teaching sure, sure. how to be a functioning citizen, how mm -hmm. to be a member of society, and stuff. And, and um, a fairly high level. I mean, high school education was like college well, today. Yeah, that yeah. too, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. And so we've seen the decline in education, and mm -hmm. I just I don't understand why there aren't more people sort of outraged 
as I am mm -hmm. about the situation that we find ourselves in now. I mean, I pay my taxes yeah. for an education that we're not getting, but it's third party payer, right? <laughs> so we're paying taxes yeah. Yeah. and then the government says, okay, this is for the schools. And so we don't even know really, we, we don't appreciate that. Yeah, the single biggest reason I think private schools work, whether they're Christian schools or parochial schools or just prep schools, is per, uh, parental involvement because they're paying a lot of money. And I think the parents want to want they're results. Invested. Right, then yeah. they're invested. Yeah, and they're directly right. involved in it. Right. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Right. I mean, so many parents today just dump the kids off. Say, see ya. And they, and they Have a good day. And I'll be drinking. Right. Well, no, <laughs> come on. But they think that they've delegated responsibility. Yeah. And the fact is that you cannot because the responsibility is always yours as the parent. Yeah. And this is what, and, but here's the thing. The schools are complicit in this sort of equation, telling the parents, hey, you back off. We've got it from here. And then they send homework home for the parents. Right. right? Make sure mm -hmm. that your child does X, Y, and Z. Right. Make sure that you, you know, bake the cookies for the bake sale, all of that, right? right. And we're good students because why? Because we all went to public schools. Yeah, we know. So this. we know how to sit in a chair, behave, follow directions. Right. This is why nobody, so, so few people think that they can homeschool, is because they're products of the education system, and they were taught, as I was taught, that they are incapable of doing anything that they haven't been formally instructed by somebody at a blackboard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, so we have this situation where now it's, it's sort of compounded because it's, it's um, uh, generation after generation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that has this same experience. And, and, and in fact, the, the opening, I gotta read this now that I've come to here, the opening quote in my book. This is Bertrand Ruff, Russell, who was quoting Fichte, who was the head of philosophy and psychology at Prussian University, which is what influenced our entire uh, school movement, right? Okay. Here in the States. As you know, our school movement was basically created over in, in um, Russia, uh, uh, Germany. Germany, sorry. Yeah, Germany. Education should aim at destroying free will so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Wow. So they are training citizens wow. to behave to be like sheep. slaves, yeah. like sheep. Yeah. Now, why don't we have civic education in our school system anymore? We used to. We used to. Yeah, I went through those classes. We don't yeah. really. Well, two weeks, maybe. Maybe yeah. they, you know, maybe they focus. We had at on least it. a semester of civics explaining. Right. How you vote. Yeah. Why you vote. How a bill becomes a, a law. Bill. You remember the song? <laughs> yeah, I'm right. a bill. I'm a bill. Whatever it is. <laughs> Capitol Hill. I can't remember it. Um, we're not. We're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Do you know why? Shall I tell you why? Sure. Why? What is our government? Our government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. Who sure. has the power in the equation? The voters. It's not the government, it's yeah. the people. Yeah. Why would the government teach the people that, that they, they have, have the, the power? power? Yeah. It's a conflict of interest. Yeah. Certainly, our federal government should not be involved in education. No. Certainly. Yeah, there's been a strong argument against the Department of Education for a long time, and I'm not sure what it is they do other than they mandate a lot of paperwork. I have friends who are public school teachers, many of whom have quit over this, just because it's all about the test scores, teach to the test, yep. and then fill out all this software right. that, by the way, we bought from our pals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's and stay a till lot, 11 o'clock at night. There's a know? lot of money in education. Yeah, there is. But it's not going to help the children. Yeah, yeah, one room schoolhouses run by moms. Well, you know, you can, you can um, suggest to your friends who are public school teachers yeah. if they are fed up with the system because they are, they are caught in the system. Yeah, they're, is, they're right? sick of it, they're sick of it. And, and typically, these are wonderful people who just want to give they to children. To help. They, they wanted, wanted to help kids. They wanted to be there, yeah. right? Yeah. They can hang out a shingle. They can start their own business, yeah. homeschooling other people's children. That's a great idea. Because we have so many dual working parent households yeah. or, or single parent households, right? Yeah. Where the, and, and that's, you know, people, a lot of people say, well, you know, I work full time. How can I do this? You know, there's lots of different ways to get stuff done. Sure. So it's, it doesn't, I, I tell my story in the book, but my story is one of 
a million oh, yeah. or more. You know what I mean? Every story is different. Every child is different. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's yeah. the other thing is, you know how different each of your children are to one another. Why, sure. would, you fit, why would you shove them into a one-size-fits-all kind of education system? Yeah, it's a bad idea. So. Bad idea. Okay, spend a minute on the movie. Ah, the movie. I love the idea of the movie. It's a Western. It's a Western. Westerns have come back thanks to the Sorbos. So, so this movie is called Miracle in East Texas, a tall tale inspired by an absolutely true story. Okay. It is the absolutely true story of the East Texas oil strike, which was the biggest oil strike in the history of the world. Really? Yes. Okay. These two scoundrels were seducing widows into investing in their worthless oil scams. Right. They did Oklahoma, they got to Texas, they set it up, set up shop again, they accidentally strike oil. <laughs> the biggest oil strike in the history of the That's world. That's hilarious. And it is a comedy. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It takes place in 1930, so it's a period wow. piece. Yeah. Um, the boys had a lot of fun doing it. Oh, bad. Um, we got John Ratzenberger to play opposite Kevin. Oh, So those are great. your two scoundrels. Tyler Maines in the movie. Wow. Uh, Lou Gossett Jr. is, oh. is, uh, 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 is great. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot Sam of fun. And Sam Sorbo? Is yes, in I'm in the movie also. Who do you play? I play one of the, I play one of the women who, uh, who was um, bamboozled, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you end so. up wealthy. Is there a happy ending? So, so of course the movie has a happy ending, but I can't tell you what the ending <laughs> is. I'm not doing spoilers. I almost tricked her into it. But it's a, com did. it's a comedy. Okay. It's a lot of fun. That sounds uh, like great it touches, fun. It touches a little bit on faith. Um, my, my favorite part, since we're here at the Freedom Fest, my favorite right. part is when one of the characters gives the message of freedom. Right. And of course, it's about oil. Sure. And when they and oil hit oil thing, in 1930, remember yeah. 1930, right after, dur you know, during this, the Depression, yeah, right after early, the stock market yeah, crash, right. this, was, this turned everything around for these people when they hit oil. Oh, yeah. So I just like putting oil in, in a... In a Nice thing. light, yeah. Uh, yeah. because you know you've got people, you've got idiots out there saying, "Oh, it, oil is so bad." Okay, give up your phone, your shoes, your belt, <laughs> your sh your shirt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Your shampoo. You walk around naked yeah. and stop using anything, <laughs> right? Because yeah. everything, you know, so much of what it's we use today based. is petroleum yeah. based. Yeah. And they have no idea. They don't have a clue. Yeah. You have President <laughs> Obama saying uh, you can open a coal plant, but we will bankrupt you. Yeah, How yeah. dare he, by the way? Who does yeah. he think he is? Yes. Then he goes on and says, you know, those jobs aren't coming back. I don't know if you have a magic wand. And Donald Trump says, well, I do have a magic wand. <laughs> it's, it's called deregulation. <laughs> and it happened. Yes. Yeah, those little towns, yes. Kentucky and Ohio yes. and places just boom, came back. Yes. It's great. Yes. We would like you, in the remaining minutes, however long you want to take, to lead oh, before people I do, to Christ. Yeah, go ahead. My radio show. Oh, I was going to ask you about your radio show. I'm sorry. That's okay. You have a great radio show. <laughs> Tell me all about it. <laughs> How's that for a question? Pretty much like this. In fact, I should have you on because yeah, thanks. this is a great conversation. Yeah, we're having a good uh, one. It's called The Sam Sorbo Show. It's on mojo50.com. Mojo50.com. M-O-J-O-5-O.com. Okay. And uh, it's weekdays from 3 to 5. Wow. And then they also replay it during the week. So if you go to mojo50.com, you can find it. I also podcast some of my interviews. Oh, you do? I oh, do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, those are picked up by Salem Communications. So I know Salem. Mike yeah. Gallagher puts them up on oh, his website, promotes okay. them a little bit. And so you can find some of the podcasts there. Great. And, uh, uh, and the show itself is also podcast. So, but I like to take, I like to pull out some of the, the, special interviews that I do and put them up on Mike Online and get and people more And it's talk all the time. Is it always interviews or do you do? No, I do a little bit of both. Oh, you do? Sometimes okay. you just hear my opinions. Yeah. Well, they're good opinions. They Thank were you. smart to hire you. They Thank were. You. Thank you so much. Don't, doesn't everyone think so? Okay, everyone applaud. <laughs> See how they're, they're just sheep. You're going to fill they're, in they're, the sound on that. They're so it products. sounds like a massive That's audience. right. They are products of the public That's school right. system. That's right. They do what they're told. That's what they do. Um, many of our viewers, many of our millions of viewers, uh, are not Christians. That's one of the wonderful things about them, because we want them to become Christians. Because they're opportunities. Yes. They're not irredeemable. That's right. So that is your camera. Tell them why they should become a Christian. Lead them in the 
sinner's prayer. Do, what, do whatever you want to do, but make them come to Christ. So I, will, I know you can do it. I will, I will reveal this. When I went on a search, and I was raised as a Jew, uh, but, not a, but not a believing Jew, so it, it kind of was like, eh. Uh, and I went on a search, and I discovered God because there is order in the universe. And then I went on a search for God. I went to church. So I encourage you to go to church because if you go to church, you will find God. He will find you. Not that you've been lost. You're not lost. But you will find God. And the more you read the Word of God, the more you understand your intrinsic value. Because if you don't believe in God, then you must believe you have no value. I don't see how you can say that you have value when you are the meter, the measure of your worth. But if you believe in God, then you know that you have worth because you were created for a purpose. And once you, once you recognize that, fear goes away, life starts to make sense, confidence comes in, and love. Did I tell you I, we just went to Israel? No, you My didn't. My first trip to Israel. Oh, that's wonderful. And. Uh, Walking in the Holy Land, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, wow. seeing the ar archaeological uh, path, right? You sure. Is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I'm still not quite recovered. Like, I'm still processing it. And, um, That's wonderful. Here's, here's the big thing. If you don't believe in God, you haven't done your research. That's really all it is. Yes. Um, and if you haven't done your research, it's for one of two reasons. You're dumb or you don't want to know. Because if you do your research and you look for clues and you, I mean, it's, it's so easy now. Go online, go on YouTube, look under apologetics, listen to John Lennox, who my husband's doing a documentary with. He's oh, really? an amazing apologist. Yeah. He's yeah. a brilliant mathematician who believes in God. Understand that scientists who don't believe in God, the more they discover about the universe, the more of them come to God, oh, come yeah. to an understanding that there must be a creator. Yeah, many intelligent, many geniuses. Yes. Blaise Pascal, for example, right. 1600s, right? right. Uh, God-shaped hole in the yeah, heart. Yeah, and he was a mathematician. Right. And he did all that study. And I'm a with, mathematician in my heart. Yeah, are you? Yeah. yeah. And he used probability theory to say, Here's the wager. Right. You know, if right. you, if you, if I'm right, and God exists, and heaven exists, and hell exists, and you reject that, right? You have made a wager. Right. Okay. Right. That's your bet. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you've bet your eternal life. Right. Now, on the other hand, if I'm wrong, and you do all of those things, all the good things. Right. What happens? You had a good life. And right. if I'm wrong, and it's all over. Right. You had a good life. If in that bet somehow yeah. it's incorrect. So, yeah, yeah, if you have any intelligence yeah. at all, yeah. why not believe in it? And the well, funny thing... Well, the other thing, thing is it's yeah. uplifting. Like, like, it's the pragmatic choice, too. Yeah. Because to believe that there is no God, to believe that there's nothing, good heavens, I don't know how you go through life. I know. Every little setback is like, I might as well kill myself now. Yeah, I know. Which is what we're doing to our children. I know. So. It's tragic. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Come again. I mean it. Happy. Happy to. She's very intelligent and beautiful and all that stuff. We are all very jealous of Kevin Sorbo, by the way. <laughs> Every man in this room has fallen in love. Aw. It's true. You're sweet. Anyway. Oh, samsorbo.com. That's right. Sam, that's how you get the book. SamSorbo.com. My devotional is there also. And what's the devotional called again? It's called Teach from Love. And okay. um, you can also find Let There Be Light. By the way, if you don't believe in God. That's a great movie, God, by the way. If you don't believe in God, go see Let There Be Light. That's right. Your husband. And if you do, go yeah. see Let There Be Light. Yeah, he was. Phenomenal. You were all good. Everybody was good in that movie. It really was. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All homeschoolers need to watch that movie. Yeah. We'll send it to them free. Homeschoolers are on the right track. I want the other people to watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless you all. And as I try to say and remember each and every time, when it comes to Jesus Christ, follow him, will you? God bless you. The Lord has made it possible for our show, Las Vegas Tonight, to thrive. We've produced well over 300 episodes 
telling the remarkable stories of Christians who have set out to change the world for the better. It's my honor to lead this ministry. As the founder of Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries, I'm commanded to be a good steward of all the donations our partners have so generously provided to us. As you can imagine, it takes a great deal of money to keep this program on the air in the United States and around the world. Please prayerfully consider making a one-time donation or becoming a monthly partner of Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries. Just go to vegassaints.org and select Make a Donation or send your check or money order made out to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. For more information, call 702-480-3989. Thank you and God bless you. Hello, I'm Dale Davidson. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Las Vegas Tonight. Allow me to take just a few moments to let you know how you can learn more about some of the fascinating guests that I've interviewed. My new book, Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints, is now available around the world. In it, I profile amazing people who make Las Vegas something much more than just a place to party. These compelling stories often tell of people who came to Las Vegas for reasons much different than the innovative ministries they ended up leading right here in Sin City. Take, for example, Tommy Scott, known as Hitman to his fellow members of an infamous gang in South Central Los Angeles. Tommy was serving time in a Las Vegas jail and contemplating suicide when a couple of pastors visited him in the lockup and led him to Christ. Tommy immediately began studying the Word and has become an on-fire evangelist and Christian author. Then there's Annie Meadows. Annie began life in a rural part of Kentucky, increasingly was fascinated with the occult, and eventually became a full-fledged witch. Rejecting anything having to do with God, she angrily vowed never to attend church or have anything at all to do with religion. Then, like Tommy, she had an encounter with the living Christ and now travels the world as a gospel singer and writes Christian children's books. Pastor Chris Chappell was an avowed atheist who also wanted nothing to do with the Lord. He was a successful businessman who felt he surely didn't need Jesus. His wife and father-in-law convinced him to attend church, and he felt a stirring that made him investigate the Bible's claims. Telling the Lord that he needed answers to his objections, he found those answers in a supernatural way and is now leading a remarkable church, Casa de Luz, in what's called the Naked City, which is a neighborhood just off the famous Las Vegas Strip. This formerly crime-ridden area is now experiencing a remarkable turnaround, and his church is serving that community in amazing ways. Doc Jones traveled to Las Vegas from New York on a personal mission to make as much money as he could. A born entrepreneur, he started a photography business that specialized in taking pictures of groups of partiers at the hot nightclubs on the Strip. He then learned that by referring young guys to the city strip clubs, he could pick up lots of cash from the club's owners. That evolved into sending young women who were wannabe strippers to these so-called gentlemen's clubs, and then he managed their careers. Eventually, he felt so empty and despondent that he, too, thought seriously of suicide. Hearing a sermon about the prodigal son caused him to dedicate his life to Christ. Now an exceptional musician and composer of gospel rap, hip-hop, and spoken word genres, he is helping change Las Vegas from a place where sin abounds to a city where grace abounds more. Pastor Clegg Seth was an aspiring actor and screenwriter in Hollywood and a strong Christian who wanted to make a real difference for Christ in the entertainment world. But the Lord called him to establish a crisis hotline for runaway teens who were coming to Hollywood to pursue their silver screen dreams. He then started halfway houses for men and women with substance abuse and other problems. 
He also helped set up a similar men's home in Las Vegas. At one point, he developed a gambling habit, but the Lord delivered him from that problem, and he now devotes his life to sharing Christ with men in prison, serving seniors in a church setting, along with visits to nursing homes and hospitals. He has continued his quest to influence Hollywood through a ministry called The Christian Studio. I personally really look up to Clegg Seth as a model of how a Christian should live and serve others. He truly is one of the Vegas saints. Read these stories and more in this 226-page book, Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints. You can get your copy in several different ways. Go to my website, vegassaints.org, or order it on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. It's just $15.99 plus shipping. For more information or to make a donation to Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries that will help us keep this program on the air, please call 702-480-3989. Or you can write to us at Dale Wynn Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara, Suite 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. And thank you so much for watching Las Vegas Tonight. A potential audience of more than 50 million people is reached every week by Las Vegas Tonight. To keep the important message of Christ's love on the air, we need your prayers and financial blessings. Please send your tax-deductible gift to Dale Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. For a donation of $25 or more, We'll send you a copy of Dale Davidson's new book, Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints. You'll love these inspiring stories of Las Vegas Christians who are changing the world. Or donate to the ministry, or order Dale's book by going to vegasaints.org. That's vegasaints.org. Or call us today at 702-480-3989. That's 480-3989. God bless you. From the story of Tommy Scott, a former gang enforcer turned Christian evangelist, to the Hookers for Jesus Outreach Ministry, to the heart-wrenching story of Arturo Martinez, and his heroic act of forgiving the man who assaulted and murdered his wife and 10-year-old daughter, Las Vegas Tonight presents an extraordinary depiction of Las Vegas as a city of transformation from Sin City to Vegas Saints. Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints, a collection of true stories of transformation, people whose lives were transformed, and people who are now transforming the world. A potential audience of more than 50 million people is reached every week by Las Vegas Tonight. To keep the important message of Christ's love on the air, we need your prayers and financial blessings. Please send your tax-deductible gift to Dale Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. For a donation of $25 or more, we'll send you a copy of Dale Davidson's new book, Las Vegas Tonight, From Sin City to Vegas Saints. You'll love these inspiring stories of Las Vegas Christians who are changing the world. You've been watching Las Vegas Tonight with Dale Davidson. Send your tax-deductible gifts to Dale Davidson Ministries, 9030 West Sahara Avenue, number 255, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89117. Or call 702-480-3989. Thanks for watching.